Hey there, Internet! My name is Jack Packard, coming to you from my office this week. My name is Darren Mooney, and I am definitely wearing pants. My name is Casey Wosu, and I'd rather not call Darren's bluff. <laughs> This week on A Marvelous Escape, we're going to talk about Episode 7 of WandaVision, Breaking the Fourth Wall, uh, a.k.a. Darren was right about everything, and I don't like it. Um, yeah, so let's let's get started right away with Episode 7. Uh, yes, go super hard on Modern Family, though the intro is also incredible. Incredibly office heavy. That intro song is right out of the office. Yeah, that that entire sequence was very the office, and I I noticed that right away because yes, everything else in the show, the episode show, uh, seemed like Modern Family, mm -hmm. but I guess the office was like the first show to do that sort of hybrid sitcom. Uh, sure, like the mockumentary documentary style, yeah. style thing, right? Yeah, like yeah. even the like the British one, I guess, was the first one, but it was still The Office, yeah. right? I don't know yeah. if there was another example, yeah. but yeah, a bunch <laughs> of shows copied it after that. So if they were going to do Modern Family, they would at ver the very least need to pay homage to The Office. Absolutely, so many crash zooms. Just a a every every three seconds, yes. another zoom to make sure you understand that we're doing mockumentary this week. <laughs> Like, pick your shot, frame your shot before you start filming. No, that's how you tell it's people not it's hard, a documentary. We don't know what these it's actors are doing. It's real and organic. Whoa, I'm zooming. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. Everything's fine. Like um, that, that's but, always bothered me. That's always bothered me about the format is that I'm not entirely sure what the rules are in that kind of sitcom mockumentary. Like, do they know that the cameras are following them all the time? Or is it just the bits where they have the talking heads afterwards? Are there like camera? How many camera teams are working on this documentary for seven years? I don't know. What's going on? <laughs> the answer is yes. And whichever's funniest. That's always the yeah. answer. <laughs> right. They've <laughs> always played fast and loose with those rules. And I think that's kind of part of the joke. Because like, like, yeah. You're always in the back of your head asking, "Well, why would anyone be filming this? Like, it's it's like a bunch of regular, <laughs> no nothing people just doing nothing mm -hmm. most of the time." But it's very funny, and so we get to see it. Absolutely. So, Darren, you called Modern Family uh, incredibly correct call on your part, uh, and you know what? I'm going to jump. It was the easy part, to be fair. <laughs> well, I, I want to jump right into the meat of the episode. Um, with your other very correct call of Agnes uh, being kind of the manipulator behind everything, and just say, boo. Yeah. yeah, what I will say is actually, like, the most pleasant part of the episode, and this is a problem that this was the most pleasant part of the episode. The most pleasant part of the episode for me was where they went and they met Monica's like guy on the inside, the aerospace engineer, mm -hmm. and it wasn't Reed Richards. And like, it was just some random person. And I was like, wow, this is a surprise. The fact that it is a stranger who I have never <laughs> met before and who isn't a major comic books character. Mm -hmm. You know, that was, that was really exciting to me, which is very disappointing when we talk about the rest of the episode, because it was very much a long way round to, yeah, this is not Wanda's fault. Or this is Wanda's fault, but we can't really hold her responsible because there's a villain. And the villain is even color coded, which I kind of admire, where it's like Wanda uses like the primary superhero color red, mm -hmm. like Spider-Man or Superman's cape or what have you. And it's like, no, just so you know that Agnes's magic is evil. Purple. Purple <laughs> all the time. Purple like the Green Goblin's uniform. You know, that sort of stuff. And it's, yeah, it was really, really disappointing. And she literally ends her song, which is a very catchy song, by announcing that she killed the dog. Which is, like, again, the shortest one-line point to this is the most evil person you have ever met. It's John Wick, you know? It's like, if you want to establish a character that yeah. has no moral or ethical nuance, mm -hmm. it's, by the way, I killed the dog. See you next week. It's, it's the polar opposite of save the cat. Kill the dog. Yeah. 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 Like I, I also was put off by that reveal, mainly because I felt like it was unearned. Like from the very beginning, we all knew that Agnes was Agatha Harkness, right? Mm -hmm. And they spent the entire time up until this episode pretending that she wasn't, like trying to lead us off the trail. 
in not even roundabout ways. Like they would give you like little nods to say like, oh, you think it's her. And then they would flat out tell you, oh, I don't know what's going on. I'm also a victim in the scenario. Mm-hmm. And then they went back in this episode and showed you those exact same scenes that you watched and just made up new context. <laughs> like she was sitting in Vision's face <laughs> laughing at him while he was concerned for her well-being. And like, that's not a thing that we ever got a glimpse of. So like, that's not something we could have guessed. They legitimately lied to us, yeah. I feel like, and then now flipped it over and it's supposed to be a big reveal. Like it just, it feels unearned. If I can, if I can be cheeky here, I can say, you know, I mean, if I were being generous and, you know, I'm a generous person at heart, what I might say is that it was all in the edit. Uh, uh, in keeping with this television mm. kind of language thing. I mean, it's like, yeah. did we actually see that shot? Maybe we didn't. Maybe because what we were getting broadcast from outside the dome didn't include well, that scene. That, that, that part wasn't part of the broadcast, though, right? Remember, because yeah. the, yeah, that inside. particular episode was following Wanda, yeah. and yeah. we were seeing Vision's adventure outside of her framing. Yeah. It, but still in the bubble. It, well, yeah, still in I'm, the bubble. I'm with I Kay- mean, I am being very generous. Yeah. I accept I'm being very generous. <laughs> I'm I'm with Casey here 100%. This was an absolute cheat. Like they cheat like you know a, a prime example of the cheat is they they have a little a fun little kind of like director actor moment when uh, Wanda is giving one of her confessionals where the director who is a clear male voice is like yeah. talking back to her, right? Then when we know that it's all Agnes doing all the bad all the time, it's Agnes behind there. That's cheating. That is absolutely giving you not all the information to a mystery because at the end of the day, this show set itself up as a mystery and it's not a good mystery if they don't give you any clues and then tell you how it went the whole way round. That's bad and dumb. (laughs) And this, this is an issue that I think is kind of interesting because one of the things that we spent a lot of this like post show discussing Mm -hmm. is the meta text where and Casey's entirely right. We spent the entire time going, Agnes is obviously Agatha Harkness. And you could tell that from context because she is another witch from the comics because Agnes sounds like Agatha mm-hmm. because obviously she has like, she gives her even the Wondergore plant in the very first episode. She's like, that's a reference to Tom King's vision comic book run. She's involved with the kids. Oh, that's got to be Agnes from the comics. But if you don't know that, you have nothing that kind of led to it. And it's kind of fascinating that you have that kind of two lane sort of process of thought where Mm. if you come into this knowing about the comics having done the deep dive having read the explainer articles or being familiar with the source material (laughs) like there's literally only one person this could be but if you're watching it completely blind you're like why why is it the woman who's barely been in the show to this point (laughs) Um, (laughs) right um and i mean like the point at which she says like oh i'm agatha harkness and it's like are we meant to recognize that name? Like, and again, right. like obviously we are because we're, we're mm-hmm. on an after show talking about one division. Yeah, and we all read comics and we all read the internet. <laughs> we know that name, right. but presumably to the target audience for one division, like she might as well have announced her name was Jeremiah Smith. You know, well, well, it's like, it, oh, it, Jeremiah, it fails on two levels because we all knew that already. So her big mm-hmm. reveal of it's actually me. We go, yeah, we we knew that already. And for anyone else, they go, who? It It's a double <laughs> failure again, because they didn't. They didn't give us any clues. They didn't lead us up to this. You know, the we've I, I want to say we've talked about this many, many times, whether it be here or over on the movie podcast, which is you want the audience to understand the information right when the main characters do. So almost like we are figuring it out with the main characters. And and it's another example of just saying, nope, we're going to give you all this information. F it. You don't know what's going on. Now you do. Bye. Mm. Uh, uh. Boo. <laughs> right before the credits as well, just so you can talk about it during the next week. <laughs> right, like, yeah. We won't, we won't even see it during the episode. Yeah. It's like all of it comes one minute before the credits roll, and it's like, well, you got a chance now to go to Decider.com and read your explainer <laughs> on who the hell Agatha Harkness is. So get to it. Do your homework. Ugh, boo, boo, well, boo. I, yeah, I, 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 really, I really did dislike that as a reveal. But uh, overall, though I liked the Modern Family aesthetic... Mm-hmm. I think I was a little disappointed with everything else that also happened in the episode because they really did kind of pad everything along until they could get to the end and do what they, I guess, considered a big reveal. Mm-hmm. Like uh, they were already, well, we were already suspecting, you know, something was going on with Monica Rambeau. We were excited to see who, you know, she was going to go meet and whatnot. Every part of that was like muted and like also disappointing. 
Like, just like Jack, <laughs> uh, not sorry, not Jack, just like Darren mentioned with, uh, what, what was her name? Goodner or something? Goodner, Goodner yeah. yeah. Goodner. Yeah, like, you guys were um, expecting possibly Reed Richards. Um, the internet got me really excited about the possibility of Blue Marvel being the aerospace mm-hmm. engineer who she would meet up with. And for it to be neither of those things and to also not be anyone else of significance <laughs> really just felt like a downer because I immediately looked up, okay, I'm like, all right, okay, the person's Goodner. Let me go look up who Goodner is. I've never heard that name before. <laughs> Nothing. No, random, <laughs> random army friend. That's who it is, yeah. <laughs> but I think, like, what the problem with that is that, like, it wouldn't be a problem if it were just a random army friend and it was like, oh, by the way, we're here to help you. Mm-hmm. The problem is the show knows how you're watching it. The show knows that fans are picking up on, I got a guy who's an aerospace engineer. And as soon as you say those two bits of information, everybody's fingers are on their keyboards. <laughs> Marvel Universe aerospace engineer. Who could it be? And it's very much designed that way. Yeah. And like, I, I don't mind that. I don't like, again, part of me is like, okay, that's a little bit of trolling and you can kind of get away with it. I'll let you off on this one. Sure. Um, my, my big issue with that. And again, I'm going to take another, another punt here just cause I, you know, I, I'm, I was, I spent so long up to this point being wrong. I'm just going to revel in being right. Just for let me have this just this once. Right. But um, Tyler, again, planning to weaponize vision. Exactly kind of what I had called and expected. Mm-hmm. It's the, the hand in the cookie jar. And something that slightly pissed me off here just a little bit is the revelation that, oh, no, 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 no. Just so we're clear. And it's the same thing that happens with Winter Soldier. It's like, look, what we're doing could be construed, could be construed as a criticism of the military industrial complex and of, you know, the way in which America as a nation is preoccupied with weapons of mass destruction, Mm -hmm. terrorism, erosion of civil liberties. This is a very weighty, very serious topic. And we want to, to know that we who write these hugely popular blockbusters have thought about this a great deal. But we also know that we want people in the armed services and involved in government to like go to our films, continue to fund us, like work as our business partners on movies like Captain Marvel. So to be absolutely clear, well, we're going to say that this fictional organization called SWORD, which exists outside the U.S. government with no remit whatsoever, no connection or anything like that, they're definitely the bad guys. They're allowed to be the bad guys because power corrupts or whatever. But we want to be absolutely clear when the Air Force shows up. Motherfucking good guys, right? <laughs> they, they even got a truck in the back. Yeah, baby. Air Force is here to sort this shit out. <laughs> And it's like, I found myself really distracted by how surreal that was. Because yeah. there's literally two encampments of army guys camped outside Wanda's red bubble. One of them is bad, and that's sword. But one of them is the most fucking awesome group of people you've ever seen in camouflage uniforms ever. And they come with kick-ass gifts, and they're the U.S. Air Force. And I'm like, I feel like maybe the show is sending mixed messages when it comes to like what the villain of this story looks like. Also, really murky imagery. I know when they were pulling up to that camp, we had already seen the sword camp before that. So when they pulled up to the camp and said, oh, here they are, I said, wait, are they meeting back up with sword? What happened to their guy? Like, that was just really confusing establishing shots from a filmmaking perspective. Yeah, like they immediately uh, they put... They look exactly the same. Yeah. They look yeah. Exactly the same. <laughs> because they're and exactly the same. They immediately because it's like put... they're serving the same function. <laughs> Like you're absolutely right, and they and they put Hayward like right back to where he was before that big disaster. Like you saw his entire encampment get devoured, and mm-hmm. it was him and like two other people. I'm like, oh crap, they got rid of like mostly all the sword or something of that nature. But the very next episode, without any buildup, no. just new guys. They're He's all fine. back. He's yeah, fine. we're just everything's fine. Here's our new camp, a little <laughs> further away. <laughs> Did, was he planning to invade, like, the camp from further away? Like, was it like, okay, we're going to go into the bubble, but I just, you know, I want people to have to drive 30 minutes to get to the bubble before we go into it, just <laughs> so we're clear. This is not a staging area. It's just like, this is just me and a couple of mates chilling outside the bubble. The mm. real camp is back here. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, and the other very, f- before I start talking about, you know, fun things or positive things, I'm going to be upset for a little bit longer, yeah, sorry, sorry. which is... Um, uh, you know, once again, the show is playing catch up with itself, giving us information we already know, which is uh, that Darcy is explaining to Vision what has already happened to Vision. And part of that is like, I understand from a character perspective, he is someone who doesn't know his past. And so you need that to happen. But did it need to take up that much screen time? She, you know, she basically like recapped um infinity war for mm-hmm. everyone who hasn't seen it and we've all seen it come on 
Uh, so th- everybody on the planet has it's seen really it. It's really true. It, uh, so many people saw it. And so that was also a little bit of frustrating where I understand they're just playing connect the dots at this point to bring everybody to the final um, confrontation. But maybe, you know, have her start explaining, cut to something else more interesting, end on her explaining, we all good, we all good. Or have, like, Michael Penner come over from the Ant-Man movies and have him explain the events of, like, Infinity War and Endgame, and I would be all over that. Do it in a fun and interesting way, absolutely. And then Thanos was like, I'm inevitable, but then Ant-Man was like, no! Right. And, you know, no no offense to Darcy or the actress. Is uh, ooh, is that Kat Denning? Kat Denning. Kat, Kat Denning, who, you know, is a very funny, uh, charismatic person, but you're just repeating information I already know. Yeah. And they, I, I was a little excited that Vision would have kind of a helper inside mm-hmm. the bubble because he's... He's the only one in there who has been trying to kind of get to the bottom of things and has the ability to kind of do anything about it. Everyone on the outside, they're all, you know, making theories and positing, but they're all pretty powerless against Wanda's abilities. Mm -hmm. So with Darcy on the inside, I knew immediately, like, as soon as Vision sees her, he's going to, you know, remove the mind stuff. And then he'll have a sidekick to, like, go up against Wanda. But it was it was legitimate stalling. And, like, I'll start, like, the more I talk about it. I feel like maybe, and again, I keep giving the writers credit. I'm like, I I can't believe that they would kind of miss the mark this much. Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming maybe this was purposefully done where like, yes, this is an episode where they're stalling to get to the big reveal that's supposed to be important, but is a letdown on purpose. Like, because they literally show those characters being stalled on their way to get to Wanda, which is the thing you actually wanted to see. You wanted to see that revelation, right? So... In a way, maybe the next episode will somehow redeem this one. <laughs> but I, I don't know. Like, because here's another another issue with is like how all of the commercials that we've seen that have come up in the middle of these shows have spoken about like Wanda's past, right? Mm-hmm. Or just given us some kind of a deep seated information that we think Wanda probably knows or is reflecting on in her subconscious, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But this commercial was about Nexus. Which is a thing that I don't think has ever been mentioned in the MCU at all. Like, I had to look it up because I wasn't familiar with it. Apparently, it just relates to a certain, like, rare super beings who have the ability to just, like, be super powerful or something like that, right? Like, mm-hmm. they can it's mess with reality realities. Or, it's the yeah, realities, reality. timelines, mm-hmm. something crazy like that. Right. Which I'm assuming relates to Wanda, but, like, would Wanda know that? Um, no. <laughs> I, I, w- I will actually set up, I did quite enjoy the naked stallingness of it and the fact that they folded the sto- the stallingness into the, like, comic book, or sorry, like, you know, sort of sitcom logic mm. of the episode we're watching. Like, the bit where the tr- where the, the lights are red and then the <laughs> truck pulls up and then the adorable kids are crossing out of nowhere. I kind of liked that stuff. That was the stuff that, um, the little bit like where they get, what's his face, um the guy who plays Vision, Paul Bettany, mm. to do sitcom body language while dressed as vision like yeah. that stuff i love the little bit where he's like you know the two of us are like uh or the bit where he looks at the camera like jim yeah um, but he's vision like that sort of stuff like that for me was probably like the best part of the episode i mean admittedly it was all transparently well we're stalling we're delaying all this stuff has to happen because we've agreed to do nine episodes and you know this needs to happen to get to the plot mm-hmm. and now we're in the final third so we can start revealing stuff but not too quickly we wanted to hit at a cliffhanger because we want people to come back next week and crash WandaVision again, by the way, which is remarkable. Like Disney Plus crashed this morning, apparently. Oh, did really? it? People had difficulty <laughs> people had difficulty streaming this at midnight on the dot. Um, oh. Apparently they were told that it was yeah, ooh, which is it gives you an idea of how watched it is, I suppose. <laughs> that's uh, wow. I think that's great. I, I it's like Yes, I, I can I can be with you. That was all fun. It was it was fun to see like superhero robot vision pretend to be in the office. It was cute. It was it was really cute when, you know, he's he's doing his like mockumentary interview and he's like, Why am I doing this? I'm a superhero. I can just and it leave. Stands up and it's Mike. I can it just stands up and it's Mike. It's be- like that's that's really fun. <laughs> But that's all dressing. That's all yes, absolutely. the fluff and the meat of the episode was really lacking for me. There there were a couple interesting tidbits that I noticed. Uh, one, speaking of the Nexus, what, what we can uh, or what I'm assuming, at least visually speaking, is that little 
witchy area under the house with all of the different symbols relates to the Nexus somehow. And it's not actually Wanda who is involved with the Nexus, but Agnes. That's my assumption based off of the visuals. Um, Oh, I hate, I just, I just hate it that Wanda's not the villain. I just, I just want, like, Marvel movies have a villain problem. Most of their villains are very weak, motivational-wise, uh, save a couple uh, who I, I really, really enjoy and are actually, you know, deep. This was a real chance to have a compelling villain who is who has like proper motivation, you know, like every her entire support structure is either dead or has abandoned her during a mental health crisis. That's beautiful. That's a beautiful villain story. And we don't get it. It's all Agnes. She killed the dog. I hate that. <laughs> I hate that. I just but like but by beating us over the head with that information, like, could it be another <sighs> red herring? Cause because it's or so purple herring. <laughs> A purple herring because it's so obvious and and they've done a really good job up to this point in leading us by the nose. Like we we all are like, oh, we're figuring all this stuff out. Like, yes, we know this, yes, we know that. They know what we know before we do. Yeah. Like they're giving us the clues that give us that information. So like it it just seems like a colossal drop of the ball that they would at this point just kind of hit you with a okie doke. I'm like, okay, yes, Agnes did all these things. Look at all these situations where Agnes was doing it. Like maybe it's and this is maybe a wild theory, but maybe it's Wanda trying to make Agnes a scapegoat by putting her in all these scenarios and whatnot. Because uh, another big issue, right, is where are the kids? Well, and see, that... that uh, well, and it, it, I guess it doesn't matter because they can just shoot a new scene and give us new information anytime they want. But <laughs> to me, that was very revealing. Because <laughs> they can make up whatever bullshit they want and rules don't matter. <laughs> the the scene with Agnes and the kids where the one telepathic kid was was saying really? it's silent around you. As soon as he said that, I said, oh, crap, she's going to be the villain, yeah. isn't she? Yeah. And, and so yeah. it's like that was very telling. That was theoretically outside of Wanda's control. Uh, no, I think I think this is just a clear case of we don't want Wanda to be the villain. So we're going to skirt around the issue, though interestingly during agnes's little intro sequence i'm the evil agnes uh we see her in a very witchy outfit transform into her black and white outfit in the black and white world so does that mean wanda created the world first and she just happened in that's what it looked like to me that wanda somehow did what ha what was going on mm -hmm. and Agnes being familiar with that kind of power or whatever was going on showed up to try and exploit it in some way. Sure. But uh, on the, on the subject of the kid, I do, I do want to say like early on in the episode uh, when Wanda's magic was kind of going wonky and things were like changing mm -hmm. between the ages and whatnot, mm -hmm. there was a missing kid on the milk carton that it's, yes. it's a blurry shot that, uh, you're you're not able to read at least like I, I actually have it pulled up on the side of my screen right now. It looks like um, one of the twins, like the younger ones, the ones who couldn't act, the one with like the shorter <laughs> bowl cut. <laughs> yeah. And I'm wondering, like, is that also part of Wanda's subconscious? Like, is she somehow telling herself like you took these kids from somewhere else and someone's looking for them, and like she has a bit of guilt about that. Mm. My, again, this is Darren swinging for the fences here. And by the way, I love, I love that I am like the least angry of Jack and KC because I like made my peace with this happening like five weeks ago. I was yes. like, this is, this is how it's going to end, Darren. Just accept no, it and, and go No, and I've been it. fighting you this entire time, which is why I'm doubly disappointed because I I'm, lost. I'm still fighting you. Like, I, I, I think, I think so they're trying to pull the wool over our eyes, but. Uh, they could be. Like, I mean, my suspicion or gut reading of this it seems to be like from what we see on screen and how it's presented if this is about agnes manipulating wanda and a large part of her manipulating wanda is about controlling the kids and it's been consistent throughout um think about how you know we talked about in the second episode things like oh it's the talent show for the kids 
for mm. the kids before Wanda gets pregnant. Mm-hmm. Throughout, you have her. Agnes is the only one who can rock the kids to sleep with her kind of ab moves. Even like last week when she was barely in the episode, Agnes features in the promo wrapping her arms around the two kids. And as Casey pointed out, the missing kid on the milk carton. My gut feeling... Um, and I may be wrong here, and it is largely motivated by the assumption that we are trying to minimize how bad Wanda's going to be allowed to come out of this. But my assumption is that Agnes is trying to harness Wanda's power mm-hmm. in some way, and the kids are a way of siphoning off that power for her. They're a way of taking that power away from Wanda, because Wanda created them, and perhaps Wanda even imbued that power in them. And it's notable that when things start going completely insane, the kids are perfectly fine. The kids are not affected by the, the kind of remotes going, or mm. the Uno going, or whatever. Mm-hmm. And like, Wanda, you know, is she's having a nervous breakdown, and it's, it's heavily implied that it is a psychological thing that's happening, but it also suggests that maybe her powers are also a bit wonky as well, which perhaps is, oh, we're taking some of Wanda's powers to do something. And this is where it gets really interesting, and I think this is a nice bridge into maybe speculation. Hmm. I take it we all watched the post credit sequence. Yes. Mm-hmm. Be- cool. Because right. for the first time in the show, we do get a post credit sequence, yes. Well, it's because we're getting more like a Marvel movie. That's how it works. It's mm. like, okay, fine. Our heroes can't actually be three-dimensional <laughs> characters, unfortunately, but you do get post credit sequences. Yeah, they're in like the um, 2010s. That was when like all the Marvel movies came no. out and became prolific. So now it's it's caught up to <laughs> pro- like modern day Marvel yeah. stuff. <laughs> Yeah, and it's like now now sitcoms are no longer your monoculture. Marvel is your god now. Um but I mean like that sequence where Petro appears and mm. I know a lot of people are like Petro at Evan Peters is not playing Petro. And like the fact that she says early on, that man is not your uncle. You were meant to go, oh, okay, so maybe maybe it isn't Petro. Maybe it's somebody posing and pretending to be Petro. And the casting of Evan Peters is like a red herring and it's got nothing to do with the MCU. Mm-hmm. Um, or sorry, the, the kind of X, XCU, as it were, <laughs> the, the kind of Fox universe that yeah, we're going yeah. to integrate. Um, and I can see that. And I think that is a red herring in large part because of what KC mentioned, the promo with the Nexus. And the Nexus is that kind of band in the Marvel universe that connects realities and the realities between realities. Mm -hmm. And it suggests that that is where this story is going on top of knowing things like the production of Spider-Man three, or that, you know, one is going to pop up in, in the multiverse of madness and the fact, and again, I maybe, I love that. We're like, I love that. We're like, we've enjoyed the show so much at this point. Let's give it as much credit as possible. The fact that the Nexus tablets that are in the promo are actually called Nexus Promotol. And it's like, yes, promo Nexus. We are promoting the Nexus here. This is the brand synergy that we're bringing in. This is what when our writers sat down and plotted the season, we were told by Marvel we had to put in there. This whole thing is going to be a promo for the Nexus. Mm -hmm. But to bring it back to the point... The episode's kind of closing scene cuts out with Evan Peters, where Mm -hmm. Evan Peters kind of shows up and he's like, Snooper's gonna snoop. And it's deliberately cut there because, of course, we want a week of speculation off the back of it. And people are gonna be like, he's in it with Agnes, or is he gonna turn Monica over and bring her downstairs as a captive or hostage because he's secretly Ralph or he's secretly Mephisto or whatever. I wonder if he's still gonna turn out to be Quicksilver from another universe because that sequence you see within that kind of like, it was Agnes all along. And by the way, again, if you watch the credits, the sequence at the end where they do the song credits, I love that it's, it was blank all along is the name of the song, but it says underneath performed by Catherine Han. So if you don't know who it was all along, the fact that Catherine Han is singing it is probably going to give you a hint. But the fact that you see her during that song, puppeting Pedro like he's got the purple glow on his back Mm -hmm. as if he's been pulled and moved somewhere like a puppet suggests that I don't think he's a conscious party to what Agnes is doing I don't think he's a partner of Agnes I still think it's highly likely that he is from another universe if not necessarily the X-Men cinematic universe because we don't want all of that baggage another universe where there's another Petro and tying him to the X-Men universe is like see it's all part of a multiverse that's my crazy kooky theory I, I think you're 
I think you're absolutely right. I think I think Agnes is the one with the ties to the extra dimensional vortex or whatever. I think you're right that she like her her generic evil plan B is to somehow utilize Wanda's extreme power level for her own evil means. Yawn, and I also <laughs> agree that uh, she she is the one who yoinked uh, Quicksilver from another universe. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, nah. <laughs> it's just so dis- <laughs> this uh, to me. This was a really disappointing episode. This was a real big bummer yeah. for me. Even no, though I agree. Like, you know, we get some fun, like, you know, Monica Rambeau going full photon. Like, yeah, OK, maybe we'll get a fight the she, next episode. Eh, eh. She does the superhero landing, she you does, know? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It's hell on the knees. Um. <laughs> I, I, I do think, uh, Darren, you mentioned the like Ralph that Agatha continuously references and is never seen. Yeah. I think that mailman guy might be Ralph. <laughs> <laughs> like cause he he keeps getting like awkwardly long like camera shots on him just yeah. kind of reacting yeah. to everything that's happening. But he doesn't <laughs> seem to be involved and at Agnes all. And Agnes did if... check him out. That's right. Agnes did check him out in the second episode she leans over she's like, I like that. I'll take a delivery of that. <laughs> mm. Thank you very much. Right, yeah. So Here's the here's the real question for uh, for information. Is Agnes uh, Agent Wu's uh, under or not undercover? Ooh. Is Agnes Agent Wu's uh, witness protection? And was she immune from the hex effect, but decided to go with it for evil <laughs> deeds? Or is someone else in witness protection? Agnes was flying around like a witch, saw the hex, and was like, "I'm <laughs> I'm in on that." Um, because we still don't know who his witness, who his witness was in yeah. witness protection. Yeah. It honestly seems like he doesn't care anymore about his witness. <laughs> so like, I like to the point where I feel like it doesn't matter. Like I, now I, I don't think it was as important as we made it out to be early on because it's like, oh, this yeah. bigger situation happened. The only reason I'm here yeah. is because, you know, I just happened to have a witness and witness protection who was around. But this I is much more Adam. important. <laughs> but, and and like I, I get that because, one, we've already had the the big, you know, uh, prices, right? Burm, 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 burm. With uh, with the aerospace engineer who's like, oh, this is definitely going to be some. Oh, it's not. <laughs> burr, 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 burr. Yep. And so, like, yeah, it could be he just completely forgets about why he was there in the first place. <sighs> to me, like, this is the difference between, like, you know, uh, uh, Darren, you you kept using the term like uh, mystery box television, which is, you know, the famous J.J. J. Abrams. You set up a bunch of mysteries uh, to keep people engaged. This is the problem with mystery box television, which is you set up all these mysteries and then forget about half of them. Uh, that's why people were so <laughs> pissed about the lost ending. I was less so because I cared about the characters. And I'm, you yeah. know, these characters aren't, like I mentioned, aren't as deep as those in Lost. And so I do care about these things that they set up and I keep getting whomped. <laughs> 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 no, I can agree. With, I can. I can agree yeah. with that. Like again, that's that's the thing is that like I, I'm not as critical of mystery boxes as a lot of people are. In large part because I think that you know the story that you tell along the way, the real the, the yeah. real television show is the friends we made along the way. But the idea that like how you get to that finale is as important as the finale itself. The only problem is that you know obviously we are now two hours out from the finale, and I think Fee- Kevin Feige has confirmed the next episodes are going to be proper hour long mm. episodes so they're going to be so they're going to take up a sizable chunk of the show and this is something that again i think i was wary of even back in the first episode which is great because i got i got all my negativity out early on it's like <laughs> now darren's now darren's just allowed to be enthusiastic um but early on i was like you know i'm loving it but i'm dreading the point where like we get to the standard superheroes punch each other through building stuff mm-hmm. and i know that's coming and i know it's going to be next week and the week after mm-hmm. and it's like i've kind of like reconciled myself like wanda dealing with her grief I've dealt with mine, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean they're they're roughly equivalent, right? Half the universe and you know the expectation of how a show is going to end. Yeah, roughly equivalent. No, and uh, like that's yeah my my big prediction for next week is yeah we're we're going f- no TV style full Marvel Cinematic Universe style and that's fine. I I like it when superheroes punch each other, so I'm looking forward to that. 
I just, I just. I like it too. I just like it when they do it in their their neighborhood, not in other people's <laughs> neighborhoods. I'm like, I'm enjoying the sitcom bubble stuff. You guys have your big knockdown brawl in like Falcon and Winter Soldier. You mm-hmm. can have all the superhero brawls you want over there. Mm-hmm. Um, we are we are getting to this point now, though, with Vision and Wanda, and you know, like the role that Vision will play in in this whole thing, as he understands now that. He is a puppeted corpse, which is which is interesting. There are still interesting things they could do there. Yeah, and I mean, again, that seems to be Agnes keeping the two of them apart from one another. And again, I worry. Like, I, I don't. This is the bit where it's like I got Darren was right last week against all odds. He's so gonna overplay his hand here, mm-hmm. but it's like I feel like the way that this is going is Agnes is keeping them apart because when Vision comes back, Vision can tell Wanda to end it. Vision will be the only person able to get through to Wanda to tell her to end it and to move on and to deal with her grief, and that's why Agnes has to keep the two of them separated. Mm. I mean, it's not the worst possible ending because it relies on two actors who are very good at their jobs emoting at one another and it feels like an organic conclusion to what came before, but it also feels just a little bit pat. You know, just a little bit kind of trite and and kind of conventional and like exactly how this sort of story is supposed to wrap up. Yeah. Okay, so if if we are looking at a resolution that's more emotional rather than like a physical, I need to stop this bad guy and once I... (laughs) punch them unconscious the situation is <laughs> resolved we we do still anticipate some sort of superhero showdown right so who who i guess do you think tyler. it'll be against because we, we're gonna see tyler monica has to come into the bubble yeah tyler has to come into the bubble all guns blazing basically that's that's like that's the crisis that's like that's how you get the scale because like you're not going to get the fight between Vision and Wanda. I don't think mm-hmm. you're going to see instead like Tyler coming in, you know, Harkness doing whatever she's doing. Wanda kind of caught in the middle of it, and Vision just Vision's goal is not to like fight anybody, but to get to Wanda. That's my kind of goal there. That's what I kind of see happening. Okay, heart and oh sorry, go ahead. No, I, I was gonna say because I I imagine like we only got a taste of Monica now being a superhero. I feel like they'll let her shine in, in at least the next episode. I don't know who she'll be fighting. Like, maybe she'll go up against Agnes because she doesn't seem interested in fighting Wanda. But like, maybe they'll go toe to toe. No, she's gonna. She's definitely going to fight uh, the sword guys because Tyler. Tyler yeah. yeah, Tyler mentioned specifically, like, do we have the thing ready to get in? So they're going to have their own, like, super soldier or a big robot or something dumb. Uh, <laughs> And it's it's going to be a massive sword that they just bring. Exactly. It's going to be it's going to be something dumb and not fun dumb either cuz like I like fun dumb. Like, you know, remember in Pacific Rim when they got the big sword? That was fun dumb. Uh <laughs> what if it's Tyler in a uniform that's like a sword? What if he's just like a superhero costume and it's just like a giant Rene Fair kind of sword? He just bends over and pokes people cuz he's dressed as a sword. That would be silly. Yeah. No, I yeah, I think Tyler yeah. has his own super or or version of a super perhaps like they have special armor that they made when they yeah. were deconstructing Vision and that was yeah. part of his plan because that's stupid yeah. bullshit. Um, I'm yeah. very negative about this episode. <laughs> I don't know what that is necessarily. Um, but so yeah, no, Monica is now going to use her new superpowers to fight the army while Wanda Vision fight the other witch. <clears throat> That's pretty not, standard. Not the army. Not the army. Oh, Jack. sorry. We're very clear. It's not the army. <laughs> no, the army yeah, is not the Air Force. Yeah. They're the good guys. The army. The army is the good guys. <laughs> They're the ones who gave her the technology to let her get in. I, I get like, and, and the thing is like, that's Monica's art because Monica's like, okay, I have to reclaim sword from this asshole yeah. who stole it from my mother mm-hmm. because, and, and that's really kind of slightly uncomfortable because it's like, yeah, Monica, I would really like you to be head of sword, but I'd like you to be head of sword because you're really good at your job. Not because you vanquished the last boss and claimed your hereditary monarchy. That's um, how the workplace works. <laughs> <laughs> how did you get promoted? I'm yeah, just, we just haven't cool. defeated yeah. Nick yet. It's coming. <laughs> For those who don't know, Nick is our editor-in-chief here at The Escapist. We are now going to battle him, apparently. <laughs> Just classic office politics. Yeah, that's how that's how it works. Oh, oh yeah, I mean, right there. Classic the office politics. That's true. No, and I, I mean, I think it's gonna be fine. They're gonna do their yeah. sword stuff. Monica's gonna fight them. Wanda Vision are gonna have a fun time fighting witchy stuff. <laughs> I guess the the disappointing thing to me is, 
I this is how I thought it was going to go is all of yeah. our information before the show started was okay yes she's the evil person Wanda's going to be under her spell yeah. but I thought they were playing us and we're going to go in a more interesting direction so my disappointment is just oh it's all the stuff I thought it was going to be it's the path of least resistance, basically. Right. Is, uh, yeah. Which, at the end of the day... Which is like, not a problem. No. Not, yeah, not a problem. You can tell good stories. Like, mm -hmm. stories don't have to be shocking or surprising. You can tell a simple, well-told story is good of itself. Mm -hmm. The problem is when you have built that story to an extent that the mystery is the point of it. When you're... Like, and particularly when the way this show is constructed with the cliffhangers and with the kind of teasing and with the promos that are edited and with the interviews that are like, oh, there's going to be a surprise cameo and it's going to be nobody who you will ever guess that it is. All that stuff is designed to make you think that, oh, okay, maybe they're going to do something mm -hmm. that will surprise me or catch me off guard. And, you know get your hopes up. And it's like, you know, I don't mind a simple, well-told conventional superhero story. Thor is one of my favorite Marvel films, the original Thor. Mm -hmm. And it's basically, arguably, just the best Superman movie made since 1980. That's <laughs> all it is, really. And I kind of have a really great, I have a great time with it. And I adore it. Yeah. Uh, but when you built up the entire show around the premise of, well, you're never going to figure out what happens next. Right. And it's like, we, he nailed it from most of the <laughs> promo or casting like, announcements. Like, we had this figured out, yes, ago. by the announcements. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so that, that makes it feel like my intelligence is being insulted, where if they were just like, this is the show, I hope you enjoy it, it's it's about expectations. Yeah. yeah. So And it's fine. Yeah. Everything's fine. Everything's fine. Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry, Jack. I'm sorry. <laughs> I know I didn't make the show, but I'm still sorry. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> or did I? <gasps> Oh, that's the Darren. that's the cliffhanger reveal. <laughs> <laughs> it was Darren all along. <laughs> all right. Well, any... I, I did not touch Cookie. <laughs> Love Cookie. Love... Uh, that's fair. That's fair. Um, any other predictions before we wrap up? Because we are at wrapping up time. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Uh, will will the kids actually be real kids, or will they be figments or siphon? vessels of power whatnot Ooh. i'm of the mindset that marvel's not gonna go that dark and those kids will somehow whether they're magical or not become wanda and vision's actual kids like i don't Ooh. think that they'll like get snapped away and they'll have to deal with the the loss sure. of their children <laughs> sure. that's my prediction my, my my worry there is though like you have at marvel as an institution a long standing and completely irrational fear of the idea of superheroes as people who can have kids and you look at things like say spider-man um, who like got married but had to sell his marriage to the devil because apparently married superheroes aren't as cool as they used to be unless they're reed richards who is not appearing in this show right um, that's my big worry is that like you look at this and they're like yeah but if we give wanda like kids then that ages her and she's old and she's not cool anymore you know i mean like that that's my fear of the conversation happening behind the scenes mm. I mean, her kids are magical. Sorry, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm so cynical. <laughs> no, that, so that's cynical. Inc I'm so cynical. that's incredibly cynical, which makes me worry that you're correct because I like I want the kids to stick around because that could lead to very interesting things happening <laughs> down the line. Um, I know yeah. something I called very early on was it was Vision sacrificing himself. What yeah. what if the the um, what if the cliffhanger is Wanda only has enough energy to keep a Vision alive or the kids? So Vision sacrifices himself to keep the kids alive. That could that Ooh, could make like for that. a fun and dramatic moment. I like that. And therefore she can't she can't look at the kids anymore because they remind her of Vision. So she hands them to somebody else and they're raised off screen. Ex That's not a bad idea. Yeah. So Dar Darren, cynical corporate, <laughs> cynical Disney executive, <laughs> sitting there puffing his cigar, going, "We can make this work." Um, <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> then they're aged up, and that's her cameo yeah. in uh, in uh, uh, multiverse. They could carry. They could carry a franchise for another twenty years. I mean, hey, we'll be putting these kids in Avengers twelve. Right, cast them with whoever you know, Timothy Chalamet, because he'll still look young <laughs> in twenty years. Uh, and then you know, you're fine. You're good to go. Uh, that so that's my prediction. I don't know if that'll be next week though, or if that's just grander prediction. My my guess is they're gonna save vision's actual demise for the final episode which final. which is my my overall prediction is vision is not making out of it, making it out of this 
Yeah, I feel like you were lucky enough to talk Paul Bettany into that makeup, like, for a short period of time, given his initial role in the Marvel movies was. And I love that he describes this in interviews, showing up in a voice booth, doing 45 minutes of work and being handed a bag of money. Um, I feel like the fact that you got so much of Paul Bettany in, like, makeup that looks like it takes several hours to apply was a blessing. Though... Um, counterpoint to that uh have you have you seen the bigger bag of money (laughs) one bigger bag of money and two there there was a a recent interview not a recent interview an an older interview with paul bettany that was been circulating recently about the the famous call he got for age of ultron and as the story goes to paraphrase it as i know we're running out of time sorry will um sorry 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 uh, to paraphrase it paul bentney was having a bunch of meetings in hollywood with different producers and all these different producers said nope don't have anything for you sorry and finally he had his last meeting with his last producer and the producer said listen i'm not going to be like these other guys i'm going to be real with you you had your chance you're not going to make it you will literally never work again i'm sorry i have to be the one to tell you that He left that meeting, apparently sat on a curb and started to reconsider his life's work when he got the call to be the live action Vision. So like literally before Vision, he was told he was never going to work again. Now he's part of the Marvel machine. That man is wearing that makeup for the rest of his life if he can. Yeah, no, I can imagine him doing pulling a Hugo weaving Mm. and being like, I've made enough money. I can now go star in BBC prestige dramas for the rest of my days. Yeah, pretty much. Like, And by the way, good for him. He's good in the role. He's such a fantastic actor. Yeah. I'm happy to see him get some success. Yeah. And he's having fun. And quick shout out. I think actually Elizabeth Olsen is great here. In particular, mm-hmm. like the sequence where she does the... Uh, that thing where she tries to turn it into a sitcom where it's like, it's probably just a case of the Mondays and there's that big dramatic beat. And it's like, what would a sitcom character say in this situation mm-hmm. to put a button on it? Oh, am I right? And it's like, like I actually really do love Olsen's performance. I think Olsen's yes. performance is really good to say a nice thing to end on a, on a no, positive note. No, and no, not just Olsen. Everyone in the show is killing it. I enjoy watching all of these yeah. people work. I just wish they had meteor uh, scripts to work with. I think they're all fantastic. It looks good. It's fine. I think it it goes back to what we talked about earlier, which is just expectations. The show set up some big expectations for itself, and it's not quite hitting them for me. What you going to do? Yeah. Like, yeah, what are you going to do? Stop watching? No, no. (laughs) No. (laughs) Crazy? I'm going to keep watching. Listen, I've watched I've watched everything Marvel, including season two of Iron Fist and the Defenders I'm, uh, and all of S.H.I.E.L.D., uh, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. <laughs> you can't get any lower. It's fine. Everything's going to be fine. <laughs> but Loki is coming up, Jack. Loki. Um, yeah, you know, okay with Loki. That, that'll probably be good. I'm quite looking forward to Loki. Uh, kind of excited really about that. To Loki. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, well, that was it. We got to go now uh, before our editor yells at us for this being too long. Once again, I've been Jack yeah. Packard. Thanks for watching. I've been Darren Mooney. And I've been Casey Wosu. And we'll see you next week, true believers.